ESAT viewers, today we are here at the University of Maryland. We are here to cover the lecture of Maaza Mangese. Maaza was born in Ethiopia. She had lived in Nigeria and Kenya before she moved to the United States. She is an author and lecturer. Today she is here in Maryland to talk about her new book, Beneath the Linus Gaze. We're going to take you inside the hall and we're going to show you what's going on. We're going to have a lecture from Maaza and then a question and answer session and book signing. We will also try to interview Maaza and other participants. We hope you're going to enjoy the program. Therefore, stay tuned. This piece was selected by The Guardian as one of the 10 best contemporary African books. The novel was named one of the best books of 2010 by Christian Science Monitor, Boston Globe, and Publishers Weekly. Mengisi is a Fulbright Scholar, a Pushcart Prize nominee, and a runner-up for the 2011 Data Literary Peace Prize. She also contributed a segment for the 2013 documentary, Girl Rising, which is part of a campaign promoting the importance of education for girls all around the world. She now teaches Radio Friday at Queens College and Princeton. Her second novel, The Shadow King, is forthcoming. Please join me in welcoming our guest tonight, Masa Magisi. It is really a, a pleasure to be here. I've had a chance to talk with some members of the faculty and the students today, and I'm so impressed with this department and the school. So thank you so much um, to Maude and everyone else for bringing me here. I, um, before I read, I'd like to give you just a, a brief um, sense of the world that this book comes from. And in order for me to do that, I have to go a little bit further back and give you a sense of my own background. Uh, this book is set during the early days of a revolution in Ethiopia that would depose Emperor Haile Selassie and install a military regime um, that would eventually fall in 1991. Uh, this book begins in 1974 and goes just a few years into that. I was alive at the beginning of the revolution. I was really very young. Um, but I remembered certain things, um, even as a child, and um, it, it, to me, the only way that I can describe them would be as if they were they were moments that were frozen, almost like a, like photographs. But I didn't know what happened before or what happened after. I would remember soldiers breaking into our house, or I would remember. Um, people being questioned. I remembered um, one of them asking me questions, but I didn't really have a sense of what was happening. And all I knew as a child was that my parents were not going to tell me anything, no matter what. Um, once I came to the US, I started trying to find out some more information. The revolution was still ongoing. I was hearing some news when I was a child, and I couldn't fully understand anything. But I had this story, uh, or at least this history in my head. And as more Ethiopians started coming to the US, and we would gather at parties, I started paying attention to the stories that they would tell. And what I started realizing was that um, I realized that they weren't telling much about their own experiences in the revolution. They may start a story and it would stop and skip a few years and they would continue. Or someone would say, oh, I remember in high school this and this person, and then the conversation would die out. And what I realized from moments like that was that um, the stories were in the silences. And the stories are from, were for me in what was not being said. So I started to read up as much as I could on Ethiopia, but I was also looking at what was happening in different countries that experienced revolution. Cuba, Argentina, um, Latin America, China, 
and just really reading novels and reading historical accounts, trying to understand how people coped. Because my sense was that I wasn't really dealing with an Ethiopian story necessarily as much as a human story of what happened to people under, in conflict, even though it was very much dealing with um, Ethiopia and my own memories from Addis Ababa. Um, I had a, a very difficult time writing the, the book or, or deciding to approach this book through fiction because I felt like I was so um, invested in that history and in my family's story, the fiction didn't seem like the right way to do it. It should be nonfiction. It should be a historical account. It should be political science. It should be something more serious than fiction. But I was lucky enough in graduate school to have a professor who was from South Africa, and he had been in prison during the years of apartheid and on death row for a number of years. And he was a poet as well as um, a memoir, a writer. And he said to me, um, you have to do this book in fiction. Um, if this is the way that you write, this is what you have to do. Because sometimes fiction tells a story that history cannot. And that was really the, the motivation that I needed to move forward with this. The book begins in 1974 and ends maybe around 77, 78. I, I don't really get into the details of the dates by the very end. But the story revolves around a family uh, living in Addis Ababa who are um, struggling themselves with what the revolution means. There is Haile, who is a medical doctor, and he is trying his best to keep his two sons away from this revolution. He's trying to keep them safe. There is Dawit, who is his youngest son, who has become involved in an underground resistance group. And there is Jonas, who is a college professor, who has a wife and child, and just wants to stay out of politics completely. But um, as you'll see in something that I'll read, it, none of them can actually avoid getting involved. Uh, the first section that I will read deals with Emperor Haile Selassie. And Emperor Haile Selassie in history was jailed um, very, very early on in the revolution in 1974. And in August of 1975, there was an announcement that went out on the radio that said that he had died of natural causes. People knew that that was not the case, but that's not what happened. Um, common knowledge now is that he was maybe suffocated or maybe strangled. Um, he was killed. And I've always wondered what that night might have been like for him because nobody truly knows exactly. And I will read a short section here of um, one night for him. And uh, I think everything here will be self-explanatory. The whistling sounded like the distant siren of an oncoming train that night. It was hollow, thin, and the rapid tap of the soldier's rifle as he walked the hall mimicked the rattle of worn rails. Something wasn't right, and where Haile Selassie could feel it, there was too much noise coming from outside. Inside, it was too still, and every sound magnified relentlessly. Even his faithful lion, Tojo, who usually whined outside his window, did nothing but jump and claw at his cage. It had been quiet since Major Gudu had ordered the emperor's family and friends into trucks that roared away into the night, but this was different. This was the silence of a muffled scream. This is why it didn't surprise the emperor when he heard the whistling suddenly die down, the rifle suddenly stop tapping, the guard step slow and come to a halt. This is why it didn't surprise the emperor when he heard the guard snap to attention and shout, Major Gudu, good evening. It didn't unnerve him to hear footsteps make their way towards the large room that was his cell. 
nor did it make him shiver the way it normally would to hear the jangle of keys and the creak of his door opening. What did surprise him was the young boy Major Gudu had brought with him, a fat boy stuffed into a military uniform much too tight for him, wearing glasses that rested on a nose. A poor woman's son, the emperor could tell by the look of him, another one of those who joined the military in hopes of steady, increasing pay, and instead found themselves at the mercy of an uncontrollable beast. The boy shuffled in behind the major and stood with his back against the wall. He blinked so fast, the emperor was sure he'd soon squeeze out tears. The boy didn't look at him, and the emperor suspected it wasn't respect that pushed the boy's neck into the creases of his fleshy neck. It was fear. Major Gudu thrust a hand behind the boy and shoved him forward. He flashed a pearl-handled pistol, and it was then that the emperor began to shiver. It was General Amman's pistol, a gift given to the war hero during the 1964 conflict with Somalia. So even this friend, the bravest, was dead. Mickey, do it, the major ordered the boy. The boy named Mickey flung himself back against the wall, away from the pistol, and stood there again blinking. If he hadn't seen the pistol, the emperor would have thought the time had run backwards, and he was reliving the last moments before the brandishing of the weapon. The boy was standing, quivering chin and neck. The major's hand was positioned in the thick of the boy's back, ready once again to shove. But from down the hall, the soft slide of leather-soled shoes floated into the room, and the emperor knew this was a brand new moment, and everything that happened from now on would happen only once. The emperor didn't understand the significance of the bloody plastic bag the major waved in front of Mickey, but he could understand the terror that wrapped around the boy's face. This was a fear, stripped naked of pretense, pure. He'd seen it in grown men only on the field. This, this was the look of a boy not yet a man, of a boy who might never fully become a man, and who now found himself exposed in the worst, most terrifying way. The major held the plastic bag and the gun in front of Mickey. You are him, he said. Remember your friend Daniel. Mickey seemed to glance at the window behind the emperor's bed, contemplating escape, and the emperor felt as if he himself was witness to a macabre pantomime, a silent play in which he was both curious audience and reluctant star. Mickey looked at the pistol. No. The major slipped the plastic bag over Mickey's head and tucked the mouth of the gun inside the plastic against the thick vein pulsing on the boy's neck. Then the major stepped so close to the soldier's fat, heaving chest that the emperor considered the possibility that this was all a dream and the two had merged into a double-headed demon. It wasn't until the major jerked his hand back that the emperor realized Mickey had knocked the gun onto the floor and it wasn't until Mickey ripped the bag off his head and sank to his knees in prayer that the emperor realized the major had moved to his bed and was looking down at him, his own pillow in hand. It couldn't have been his voice that said, what has taken 3,000 years to build can't be destroyed in one night, but he didn't know who else could have said it. And it couldn't have been he who looked at the cowardly fat boy and said, be a man, watch this. But it was his mouth moving, though the rest of his body was as still as a statue. It could have been that the whistling was also in his imagination, that it actually didn't get louder, that the major's footsteps didn't shuffle to his bed, that Mickey didn't actually say, how can you? He is the emperor. The emperor wasn't sure of anything anymore, and he told himself that it wasn't a pillow pushing against his face, flattening him to the mattress, pressing down so hard that he could feel the bed springs. He told himself it was Angel Gabriel come down to bear witness. He convinced himself that the soft feather that floated out from a tear in the pillow was proof that angels existed 
and Legion were helping him right now, easing the pain, the pain of Eris' lungs. And it all happened so quickly, so quietly, so effortlessly, that Emperor Haile Selassie believed that it was all a dream, just another act in a silent play. And the heavy sleep that engulfed him was due to nothing more than an old man's fatigue. And then I'm going to move about three years into the revolution. And the regime has uh, now fully instated itself um, in, in ruling Ethiopia. And my main character, Hailu, who is a doctor and a surgeon in a big hospital, a black lion hospital in Addis Ababa, um, has been brought uh, a special patient, a prisoner, and he's told by the soldiers to, um, to heal her so that she can go back into custody. And this is a young girl who has been interrogated severely. And Hainu is worried what will happen if he takes care of her and heals her and she goes back to jail. So this scene um, takes place one night after his shift. The human heart, Haile knew, can stop for many reasons. It is a fragile, hollow muscle, the size of a fist, shaped like a cone, divided into four chambers, separated by a wall. Each chamber has a valve. Each valve has a set of flaps, as delicate and, wet and frail as wings. They open and close, open and close, steady and organized fluttering against currents of blood. The heart is merely a hand that is closed around empty space, contracting and expanding. What keeps the heart going is the constant, unending act of being pushed and the relentless, anticipated response of pushing back. Pressure is the life force. Hailu understood that a change in the heart can stall a beat, it can flood arteries with too much blood and violently throw its owner into pain. A sudden jerk can shift and topple one beat onto another. The heart can attack. It can pound relentlessly on the walls of the sternum, swell and squeeze roughly against lungs until it cripples its owner. He was aware of the power and frailty of this thing he felt thumping now against his chest, loud and fast in his empty room. A beat. The first push and nudge of pressure in a heart, he knew, was generated by an electrical impulse in a small bundle of cells tucked into one side of the organ. But the pace of the syncopated beats is affected by feeling, and no one, least of all he, could comprehend the sudden, impulsive, lingering control emotions played on the heart. He had once seen a young patient die from what his mother insisted was a crumbling heart that had finally collapsed on itself. A missing beat can fill a man. A healthy heart can be still by nearly anything. Hope, anguish, fear, love. A woman's heart is smaller, even more fragile than a man's. It wouldn't be so surprising then that the girl had died. Heidi would simply point to her heart it would be enough to explain everything. He'd been alone in the room, the soldiers smoking outside. He could see their shadows lengthening over the bare and brittle lawn as the sun swung low, then lower, then finally sank under the weight of night. It was easy to imagine that the dark blanket outside had also swept into the hospital room, though the lights were on. It was the stillness, the absolute absence of movement, which convinced him that they too, this girl and he, were just an extension of the heaviness that lay beyond the window. She'd been getting progressively better, had begun to wake for hours at a time and gaze terrified at the two soldiers sitting across from her. The soldiers had watched her recovery with relief, then confusion, and eventually guilt. 
Hilo could see their shame keeping them hunched over monotonous card games. It hadn't been so difficult to get the cyanide. He'd simply walked into the supply office behind the pharmacy counter, waved at the board pharmacist, and pulled the cyanide from a drawer that housed a dwindling supply of penicillin. Back in the room, Hilo prayed and made the sign of the cross over the girl. Then he opened her mouth and slipped the tiny capsule between her teeth. What happened next happened without the intrusion of words, without the clash of meaning and language. The girl flexed her jaw and tugged at his hand, so he was forced to meet her stare. Terror had made a home in this girl, and this moment was no exception. She shivered though the night was warm and the room hotter. Then she pushed her jaw shut, and Hylou heard the crisp snap of the capsule and the girl's muffled groan. The smell of almond, sticky and sweet, rose from her mouth. She gasped for air, but Hylou knew she was already suffocating from the poison. She was choking. She took his hand and moved it to her heart and pressed it down. He wanted to think that last look before she closed her eyes was gratitude. It was only Almaz who recognized the vivid flush on the girl's face, the faint hint of bitter almonds, and known what had happened. She'd walked in just as Hilo was explaining to the soldiers how the electric shocks she received had damaged her internally. Oh, Almaz said, yes, she collected herself. It was too much for her, too much infection. The soldiers had been agitated. They paced back and forth. They asked Hailu again and again to explain exactly what, what had happened. The infection was climbing from her feet to her heart, he explained. There was no way to stop it. She was too weak to fight it. But she was waking up, they said. She was getting better, they said. Hailu's palms were sweaty. He heard a ringing in his ears that seemed to get louder as he talked. He cleared his throat. It was a surprise for all of us. I'm a witness, Alma said. There was nothing we could do. The soldier started, looked at his partner. We can't say anything for a few days. He nodded just to the girl. Yesterday we told them she was fine. I'll write up the death certificate, Hyder said. Everything will be explained there. And yet now, Hyder sat in the dark. He'd been summoned to the jail, officially. His presence was requested in writing, delivered to him by three skinny soldiers who spoke in unison. They'd walked into the hospital and gone to his office. They stood in a straight line, their shoulders even, their identical uniforms, the way they each planted their feet, the exact same width apart, and had their hands folded in front of them, fingers plated together, made Hyman think he was looking at triplets, though they were nothing alike in appearance. You were told to come in, we spoke to your friend, they said. Here is a written order. Come to the jail tomorrow. Arrive by dawn, they said. The colonel wakes up early. They kept their eyes lowered, but even then, Hyla felt their indifference to his status and age. What is this? He looked at the ink signature at the bottom of the letter and tried to imagine a man who sat moved across the page with such rough sweeps of the pen. I have to work tomorrow morning. I'm scheduled for surgery. Two of them turned to look at the third soldier. He stepped forward. Don't disobey orders, he said. His eyes were the color of a premature leaf, his pupils black coins floating in a pool of green water. Should I bring a suitcase? Hyman asked. Most prisoners were ordered to bring a suitcase of clothes under the pretext that they'd return home eventually. Soldiers took the suitcases and added to their wardrobe. Many of them were into bars and parties, the clothes of those they'd executed. The third soldier looked at him. You won't need to, he said. Hadu tried not to think about the fact that no one he knew ever returned from a summons to jail. Tomorrow, they said, before walking out of the office, don't disobey this time. 
Now, Hyde was in his chair with the lights off. He sat with his back straight as a tree, and he waited. Though for what, he wasn't sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maza. You had a wonderful presentation. Thank you. How did you find the event? Wonderful, wonderful. I like Maryland very okay. much, the DMV area. Okay. Yes. Okay. Is it your first time to speak in the DC metro area? No, I've, I've spoken before, but this is the first time here, here, here in, in this school. Maryland. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, when did you begin writing this book for the first time? Uh, I really, I started writing seriously in um, 2004. And the book took about five years to complete. Wow. Wow. And so, it, and it was released in 2009. Okay. 10, uh, I, 2010. 2010. Okay. Yes. I heard you explain how you uh, began writing the book, but do you remember the motivation, the inspiration that uh, pushed you to begin writing about this book? I think my, it was my own life story, just the story of my family during the revolution and some of the things I could remember, but the inspiration came from the fact that my family doesn't want to talk about this time, right? You ask yeah. your mom, you ask your dad something and they don't want to say anything, but the revolution is why so many of us are here in America now. Yeah. And I was curious about how I came here, why am I here? what created that, that change, and research became the motivation for the book. Okay, okay, yes. Okay. How do you go about writing? What's your process? You have to write every day. You have to write it's every like day. Lifestyle. Just, it has to be a lifestyle. You don't go out as much. I have to skip parties. I have okay. to, you know, I'm <laughs> sitting at my desk. Life. I have yeah. no social life right now. Okay. And, uh, but it, it doesn't have to be a lot every day. It could be one sentence, three sentences, one paragraph. But it, that has, little by little, it builds. And also reading, to read a lot, okay. yes. Who's your prime target? You know, anyone who likes to read. You know, some of it, the, it could be Americans, it could be Abisha who don't know enough because they were born here or their parents don't talk about it, but also the people who were involved in Ethiopia who were revolutionaries or they were part of any movement during that time. They read the book and they tell me, this, this character is me, this one is me. So maybe it's for them also. Okay. Yes. Uh, what were your goals when you write this book? I only wanted to finish the book. Okay. I, I did not, I only now wanted to finish. Now I, finish I did it. the goal, yeah. <laughs> so I had no idea it would get published. I had nothing. I was just writing, yeah. just yeah. hoping, but I just wanted to finish. Uh, what about your next book? I heard that you have another book. I have another book, and it is set during um, the Italian uh, invasion okay. and occupation of Ethiopia. So now I'm going backwards to 1935 wow. and telling the story of, uh, we don't, you know, we know the stories of, of the big people in the wars, but we, d we don't know the normal, the peasant farmers, those stories I'm interested in. Is it going to be a novel? Or it's a novel. Okay. It's a novel, okay. yes. By the way, uh, are there some true stories from your uh, book? Um, you know, some of the stories, the in the, some of the scenes that are in the book came from my own memories. So I wasn't, I knew those things because they happened to me or they happened to my family. I was young, but some of the scenes that happened there, I, I was there, I, I remember. So it came from that time. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, when are you going to release your second book? Oh, you good question. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but we'll, uh, yeah, we'll say I'm not quite sure. It's work in progress. So, um, yes, God, it will be out. That's it, God willing, but it, it will happen. Do you have any message uh, to our audience? Uh, for read those, yeah, well, yes, read the book, but also I think for anyone interested in writing, um, young Abisha who are wanting to write and the parents of these Abisha, 
you have to encourage your children to write stories and to also be in the arts. My parents wanted me to be a doctor, wow. yeah? So completely different, but um, we need more people telling okay, stories in different ways. Well, writer. they were scared in the beginning, so <laughs> <laughs> they were scared, but we need people to do different things. Yeah. So I say go for your dream, practice discipline every day, no matter what you do. Yeah. Congratulations, and we are so proud much. of you. Uh, thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tell us your name. Hi, I'm Abigail Tagasu. Okay. Yes, and that, that's Abigail in English, you know, Amharic version. Okay. You are a student? Yes, I'm a junior neurobiology and physiology major. Um, Second year or first year? Third. Third year. Yes. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. okay. uh, why did you come? Actually, a friend of mine is taking a creative writing class, and she invited me. She's like, there's a wonderful Ethiopian writer, you know, coming to speak and present and so I've I've actually haven't heard of her and so yeah. I came just pure interest. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, how did you find the event? It was amazing. Um, the novel, I personally haven't read it yet, but it's it's something I definitely will look into. It's um, from the brief expert excerpts that she gave, it's actually very moving in the historical sense that um, a lot of Ethiopians might not know, you know, their own history. Do you have a plan to write? I am um, a freelance writer. I like, I, I do like writing on my own free time. Um, I'm, th that's it. Like, I basically just dabble in it, but um, it is a great outlet for me. Um, I don't plan to do it professionally, but I think it, th this is like um, incredible what, um, she's done with this with her work with her talent how do you feel about her because she's a successful ethiopian writer i feel absolutely like great pride to know that she comes from the ethiopian community and um, there is you know we have a, a great sense of pride in our strength in our um overcoming of like historical references, you know, the Italians and so on and so forth, you know, multiple different things. And I believe that this, this, um, she brings that to light. You know, we are, we are conquerors. We're very strong. We, um, have our own views and to also bring our political history into her storytelling. I find it very amazing. It's very inspiring. What do you tell to other aspiring writers, especially, uh, female writers, Ethiopian female writers? I think, um, especially in our culture, we're, you know, we're mainly geared to look at specific career goals like medicine, engineering. I think writing is a very admirable, um, you know, goal and dream to, to go towards. And I think um, future aspiring Ethiopian writers should definitely pursue their dreams, whatever it may be. Um, and. Um, just like we've seen, you know, with, with this coming of the book, there there's talent out there, and there are stories that need to be told. Um, you know, we, we don't want to continue telling the stories in silence. We want to hear them. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Tell us about your name. I'm uh, Dr. Brian Chappelle. You are a lecturer here? No, I am uh, in work for Department of Defense. Okay, uh, how, 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 uh, how, how, sorry, let me start this. <laughs> how have you heard about uh, the group? I went to uh, undergraduate with Maza. We went to University of Michigan back in uh, the 80s. Okay. Have you read the book? Uh, most of it, yes. Okay. Which part uh, did you like the most? I like the, the uh, when they're talking about the square, when you, you get about uh, the lion's gaze, the square, um, where they feature the line where they're talking about uh, the revolution and the vividness of her descriptions of the, uh, the battle and the street protests leading up to the, uh, the revolution there. Have you read uh, other books on Ethiopia? No. no. This is your first time. But have you read other historical books, uh, fictions? So how do you compare other books with Mahaza? Well, I'm biased, of course, okay. because she's <laughs> your friend. <laughs> she's a she's a good friend, so of course I'm biased. But I, I I like the like I said the vividness of her description. It's it's a very intricate details, like when she's talking about the pounding of the heart, 
and the, the, the colors and descriptions of the blood and the emotion that goes into it. It's like something that you feel. It's like a piece of, it's like a piece of art. That's w uh, wonderful. Have you asked other people about the book who read the book? No. No? no? Uh, do you have a plan also to read her books, uh, future books? Yeah, I'll, I'll read all of her books. I mean, it's, it's my, I, I call her my most famous friend, so I'll, <laughs> I'll read just about anything that she writes. Thank you very right. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear our viewers, this is our hope that you have enjoyed the program. The program was very vibrant, the presentation, and also uh, offline discussion with the author and other participants. And uh, this is also our hope that you have enjoyed the interview and the discussion I had with Maaza and also with other participants. Until I see you next time with another similar program in the future. Have a wonderful time. This is Asagid Haftold reporting for ESAT from the University of Maryland. Thank you very much for watching.